Hey there, Cognacs. During an AMA on Reddit after season two of Only Murders in the Building, showrunner John Hoffman stated that there was a villain that runs throughout the entirety of the series, something along the lines of Moriarty. Right after season one, I had a theory that there was a larger conspiracy at play. Though some of those ideas have been proven wrong, one part still seems true. It all points to Howard. I will go over some confirmed loose ends, put them into context with some theories, and altogether I hope you can see why I believe Howard could fit the identity of a series long villain. For my longtime followers, there will be a little bit of a rehash of some things I stated after season one, but adding actions and context from things from season two and three. First, for the uninitiated, let me explain to you what or who a Moriarty type character is. Professor James Moriarty is a fictional character and criminal mastermind created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle to be a formidable enemy to Detective Sherlock Holmes. Moriarty is known to use his intelligence and resources to provide criminals with crime strategies and sometimes protection from the law, all in exchange for a fee or a cut in the profits. Through many adaptations, Moriarty has become known as Sherlock's arch enemy and many other detective stories often refer to their big bad who opposes their main protagonist as a Moriarty. In the Reddit AMA, John Hoffman states that the poisoning of Oliver's dog Winnie and the letter on Jan's door stating I'm watching you both remain part of the many mysteries in the Arconia. To me, this means that the Moriarty character is intrinsically tied to the Arconia. If this Moriarty character is Howard, why would he do all this? Why would he choose to be some criminal mastermind? And I believe it could boil down to the relationship with his mother. Howard has mentioned in season two and three that his mother stifled his dreams of being an actor. It's clear he grew up with strong passion of the arts, but was constantly discouraged from pursuing that dream. Over time, the constant rejection and lack of support may have led to a growing sense of frustration and resentment. I surmise that one day Howard stumbled upon a criminal opportunity. It could have been something along the lines of IDing the 6th Avenue slasher, confronting them with evidence of their crimes, blackmailing them. Howard would see this as a way to gain respect, wealth through illegal means presenting an opportunity to prove himself a star in his own story. Who knows, maybe he is the 6th Avenue slasher himself, and he killed as a means to take power back that he felt he lost. Howard works as the assistant director of collections at the Manhattan Library. This takes budgeting, selecting, storing, and improving resources, this physical and digital. The assistant director of collections would analyze and report collection data. You need strong organizational and budgeting skills, managing personnel, mentoring others. And you have to have knowledge and support a very diverse range of ideas. Though he doesn't show it, these are qualities Howard must have acting in that role. He has to have strategic thinking, planning, and leadership. Howard very likely has a master's degree in order to be in this position. Using these qualities and information available to him through the library, I can see Howard using his know-how to help coordinate criminal activity through multiple parties while taking a little bit off the top. But above all, leaving him with one of the most powerful currencies, information, knowledge of others and their actions. With this, Howard could have quickly rose through the ranks of the criminal world, using his skills to outsmart law enforcement and other criminals. Howard's desire for recognition and success, which he had initially sought through acting, could now be fulfilled through his criminal endeavors. Howard could now have a sense of control and importance that he never experienced before. This would mean that Howard would have prior knowledge and likely has some involvement in Teddy's black market jewelry business. He may have known that Tim Kona was onto Teddy and orchestrated Jan and Tim getting together in order to keep tabs on him. It was hinted that Jan may have killed before previous lovers. 
Maybe Howard has helped Jan in the past, possibly with his knowledge of toxins that she could use, procuring them for her and facilitating her alibi. Howard may have influenced Poppy to murder Bunny. I'm guessing it would be to garner more control of the Arconia, and it would make sense that such a person could have been how Poppy learned about the secret passageways. These are just ideas, but let's do a little more decoding based on concrete information. In Season 1, Episode 2, many members of the Arconi were present at the memorial for Tim Kono. And if they paid attention, they would have known that the trio was recording information about Tim's death, but not necessarily known that it was a podcast. This is the first time the trio talk to and record Howard Morris, who laments about his cat dying. In Episode 3, Howard becomes the trio's first suspect. He's questioned by Mabel and Charles about Tim Kono. Interestingly enough, the moment Charles states that they are being recorded, his nose starts to bleed, and Howard faints. And when he comes to, Howard states that he has a vasovagal syncope and faints at the sight of blood. This stops the questioning in their tracks, causing Mabel to believe that Howard is now cleared of Tim Kono's murder. But after leaving, Charles tells Mabel that he didn't think that Howard was being truthful and that Howard was acting. What? You bought that? The fainting act? I can spot actors a mile away. But we'll come back to why that may be true later. At the same time, Oliver asks for funding for the podcast from Teddy Demas, but is initially turned down until a talk with Charles makes Oliver go back and not take no for an answer. Later when Oliver arrives home, an hour after the first episode of the podcast has been published, with only four listeners, he finds a note on his apartment door that says, In the podcast, or I and you. And inside, lovable Winnie was poisoned. At this point, Teddy and Sting are the only people we know 100% knew of the podcast. But Howard did know that the trio was recording information and investigating Tim's death. If he was in cahoots with Teddy, it would be logical that Teddy would tell Howard about this podcast. Either way, of the four listeners, it's likely that Howard would be among the first to know and listen, and in turn, even if it wasn't for the reasons stated above, he still could have been the person to write the note on Oliver's door. I believe Howard is afraid that a podcast about a death at the Arconia may draw unwanted attention to him and his actions, or his past actions. He could easily be the one that threatened to kill the trio and use his connections to stifle the investigation, stopping a talk screening and cellular exploitation as it would lead to Jan, who in turn could rat him out. The opening lines by Charles for the series states, Nobody ever discovered 19 bodies buried in their backyard. Maybe there are 19 bodies buried in the courtyard of the Arconia. We don't know what Howard may have done all his years in the Arconia. These are mostly ideas that I've had after season 1, but I didn't make an update after season 2 because I didn't think I saw any clues, but I may have been wrong. In Season 2, Episode 2, Howard goes to Charles' place and talks the trio into going to Bunny's memorial. Howard states that he appreciates what the trio did for the building, and he knew that Jane was the killer by Episode 8, but he wanted to see how it ended. What could have happened in Episode 8 that made it clear to Howard that Jane was the killer? Well, in Season 1, Episode 8, Jan is adamant that there is nothing in Tim's phone that ties the Demas family to the murder. And though Jan knew he wasn't the guilty party, Jan tried to point the trio to Howard as the suspect. Jan specifically stated Howard was the first suspect and not a bad one. Why would the killer not let the trio continue on with their idea of Teddy being the culprit when they weren't looking at her, and not just once? but multiple times over the span of hours tell the trio to look into Howard. I believe Jan wanted Howard to be investigated. I'm assuming that it's because she is well aware of some of the crimes that he has committed, and likely Howard doesn't trust Jan, and though she couldn't outright say Howard isn't what he seems, 
Without incriminating herself, she still wanted someone to take a closer look at him. Howard could have easily left Jan a note on her door telling her that he's watching her, making sure she doesn't do anything or say anything that jeopardizes him and his criminal empire that he runs throughout the Arconia. If Howard is a big player, this threat may have been enough for her to feign being attacked to help throw the podcasters off the trail and show her loyalty to Howard. At the killer reveal party, Charles is stabbed with a prop knife and Howard faints. When Charles gets up showing he wasn't actually stabbed, Howard faints again. Moments later, Howard gets up, stating he only faded once and the other times he was acting. The key word is times, plural, not one time. And I believe this is a reference to Howard fainting in season one at the sight of blood, making three times Howard has fainted. But this begs the question, what times was he acting? I think it's obvious that the third time he fainted, it was clearly an act. The way he overdramatically flaps, it screams acting. But what if the first time we see Howard faint, this too was an act? It was just a small bit of blood on Charles' lips, and collapsing onto one's legs and falling back is not very common of someone fainting. Again, Charles stated that he believed that Howard fainting at this moment was acting. I find it more likely that the one time Howard actually fainted was the second time, where at the killer reveal party, Everyone that was there was not privy to what was going on. Is this all part of the plan? I'm really not sure anymore. This could have included Howard, but most importantly, this was the moment that we see the most blood, making Howard's first faint fake in order to stop Charles and Mabel from questioning him about Tim Kono. In seasons two and three, Howard has repeatedly found himself in the middle of what's going on, staying close to the podcasters, attempting to get in on episodes, throwing people like Nina Lynn under the bus as suspects, helping decipher what was shredded in the stage manager's office. It was even Howard who bumped into Detective Kreps that allowed Mabel to realize that his arm was hurt from being stabbed by her knitting needle and to see the glitter on his neck. For not being directly related to anything, Howard seems to be around a lot of what's going on. Now, I know I did jump to a lot of conclusions here, but I think there's something strange going on with Howard. It seems like there could also be something with Howard's cousin Moses Morris, who runs sponsorships for State Farm. Howard believed all it would take was a call and he would get them to sponsor the play. That's a pretty big pull. Howard states that he doesn't have a therapist and he calls his cousin when things go wrong. This sounds a little bit mafia mentality to me. I know it's not likely that State Farm would have a show pin them in such a negative light. So I'm going to put a pin in it, but if Moses Morris is mentioned in the fourth season, I'm telling you, he's got something to do with it all. But those are my thoughts on why Howard is the Moriarty character. Let me know if you think that it's possible or who you think it could be. Do you think it's someone we haven't met yet? Share your thoughts down below. And if you like this, give this video a thumbs up. Next week, I'll have another video on the people I think it could possibly be, or it would be interesting to be, but there isn't much pointing in that direction. It's just some fun ideas. Either way, thank you guys for watching. My name is Dallas, and I'll catch you on the rooftop.